Well, hi there, and welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Real Estate Investing. I'm your host, Sharon Bornholt, and I'm so glad you're here today. My guest today is the land geek himself, Mark Podolsky. He has been on my show several times now, and I couldn't be more excited to have him on today. Mark bought his first few parcels of raw land back in 2001. He's mastered the art of working smarter and rather than harder, and I want to talk about that today. He's also completed 5,000 land deals with an average ROI of 300% on cash flips and over 1,000% on the deals he sells with financing terms. Mark is the author of Dirt Rich. Um, I just found out he's writing a second book. He is the owner of Frontier Properties, and he's also a mentor, and he coaches other people on how to achieve the same success that he's found with land. So prior to investing in land, though, he had a high-stress corporate job that he couldn't wait to escape. So I like to think that's how he's so good at systems and processes, but I don't know if that's actually true or not. So welcome to the show, Mark. Sharon Vornholt, it's so wonderful again to be back on your show. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things like I can't get enough of your accent. <laughs> I, you know, I can just listen to you talk all day long. Uh, Thank you for having me. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're here. So um, I know uh, kind of your backstory, but I'm give everybody a little bit of, about your backstory and, and why you chose land as an investing strategy. Right. So I was a very miserable, micromanaged, overstressed, felt like I had no control, 45 minute commute to work and back investment banker, specializing in mergers and acquisitions with private equity groups. And it got so bad for me, Sharon, that I wouldn't get the Sunday blues anticipating Monday coming around. Mm -hmm. I'd get the Friday blues anticipating the weekend going by really fast yeah. and having to be back at work on Monday. So my firm hires this guy and he's telling me that as a side hustle, he's going to tax deed auctions. He's buying up raw land, pennies on the dollar. He's flipping them online and he's making an average return of 300%. Mm. So Sharon, I'm looking at companies all day long in a great company, a great company has 15% EBITDA margins or free cash flow. Average companies, 10%. And I'm looking at companies all day long, less than 10%. So of course, you know, I'm from the Midwest, just like you, I'm from St. Louis, show me state. I don't believe him. The show me state. So <laughs> I go to, I've got three grand saved up for car repairs. I go to New Mexico with him. I do exactly what he says to do. I buy up 10 half acre parcels, an average price of $300 each. I put them up online. They all sell for an average price of $1,200 each, 300%. It worked. Wow. So I took all that money. I went to another auction. I'm living in Arizona. And again, this is 2001. There's no one in the room. I'm buying up lots. I'm buying up acreage for like nothing. And over the next six months, I sold all that property. I made over $92,000 cash. Oh, wow. So I go to my wife who's pregnant. I said, honey, I'm going to quit my job <laughs> and become a full-time <laughs> land investor. And she said, absolutely not. So I said, okay, okay. So it took me 18 months for the land investing income to exceed the investment banking income. And then I quit and I've been doing it full time ever since. And I absolutely love it. Well, I know, I know that you, you were lucky to have stumbled on someone to help you out and mentor you because when, when I first, well, I first learned about in the, uh, land investing from you. And um, for me, it's like, what the heck? You know, I know houses and land to me was like, it was like speaking a foreign language. And I think that's where I think people don't understand because it's still like, oh yeah, you can really put that on, just put it out there and sell it that easily. I, th I know people think um, this, it can't be true. It's too good to be true, but that's obviously not the truth, the case. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it's hard to wrap your head around it because we can mm -hmm. all wrap our head around the fact everybody needs a place to live, but nobody needs raw land. Mm -hmm. But if you look around your house, 99% of what you have, you don't need. Right. It's what we want. And there is a lust for land in this country that most people don't realize. So we have this massive market, nobody really doing it. And then you have a, a huge market demand. So now I've done over 5,500 land deals and Sharon, I've never been stuck with a piece of raw land. 
Never. I've never had a piece of raw lamb that I couldn't sell. Wow. There is a pig for every barn. And until you start doing it, you realize it. And a lot of times you have to hear it from someone else besides me because it's like, oh, well, of course Mark's going to say that. Mm. Um, he's, it's, so, it's like self-serving. But when you hear it from, you know, our clients and other people, you see how this model has really moved the business in their life. Mm -hmm. Because the way that we like to do it is we want to get you out of solo economic dependency, which means if you're not working, you're not making any money. Mm -hmm. So the goal being, can you create enough land notes where your passive income exceeds your fixed expenses? And now you're working because you want to, not because you have to. Mm -hmm. And that's like the whole goal. So I think I know the answer to this one, but has your business been affected by this uh, COVID-19 pandemic at all? It, it has been. It's gone up. Uh, tremendously. It's gone up tremendously. I knew you so were going to say that. We, we so we've sold this week 14 properties. Um, it's insane. We can't buy enough. And it's a good problem to have. But what happens in, in uh, this type of crisis when you have such stock market volatility and you've got the government going deep into debt, trillions of dollars in debt, you're looking at an inflationary environment. Mm -hmm. And traditionally, where do you go? to do an inflation hedge, you buy real assets, you buy raw land, you buy gold, you buy silver. Mm -hmm. And those are like your safe haven investments. So of course, that's where people are, are flocking to right now. That's amazing. Um, I, I bet you that when people listen to this, you're, they, they never gave that a thought that land would fall into that category. Um, let's talk about creating passive income. You touched on that, the notes. So we're back to houses again. Everybody understands rental property. So how do you make money and how do you create a passive income with land? Okay. So Sharon, you're in Louisville, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pretend you own 20 acres of raw land in Texas Okay. and you owe $200 in back taxes. Mm -hmm. So I get the list from the County and I see, Oh, Sharon Vornholt. There she is. She owes 20. She owns 20 acres in Texas. She lives in, Kentucky, and she has she owes back taxes. Mm -hmm. So you're advertising two things to me, Sharon. Number one, you have no emotional attachment to that raw land, and number two, you're distressed financially in some way mm -hmm. because well, we don't pay for things, we don't value them in the same way, and you haven't paid your property taxes. As a result, the county treasurer keeps sending you notices saying, Sharon, if you don't pay your property taxes, we're going to auction off that property to a tax deed or a tax lien investor. Mm -hmm. So all I'll do is I'll look at the comparable sales on that 20 acre parcel and I'm going to take the lowest comp and let's say it's like 10 grand. Mm -hmm. All I'm going to do is divide by four and that's going to get me what Warren Buffett would call a 300% margin of safety. So I'm going to send you an actual offer for $2,500. Now you accept it because for you $2,500 is better than nothing. Mm -hmm. Now between you and me, in reality, three to 5% of people accept our quote unquote top dollar offer mm -hmm. of 25 cents on the dollar. So after you accept it, I go through due diligence or in-depth research, make sure you still own the property, confirm back taxes are only $200. We'll go to our team in the Philippines. They're connected to an American title company. Mm -hmm. So if I'm paying 5,000 or less, they'll, they'll do the, the title search. I wanna make sure there's no breaks in the chain of title, right. no liens or encumbrances. And then I wanna know like, what's compelling about the property? And I might have somebody locally go out, shoot pictures, um, video, fill out my property checklist, make sure no one's dumping on the property, right. whether the road's like, how far from the nearest hospital, Walgreens, Walmart, et cetera. So once I get all that and it all checks out, I will buy the property from you for uh, $2,300. So you get $2,300, $200 goes to the county, I'm all in for 2,500 and then Sharon, I'm going to sell it 30 days or less because I have a built in best buyer. Do you remember who it is? The neighbors. Oh, the neighbors. Okay. The neighbors. No. Okay. So the neighbors. Okay. So okay. I send out those neighbor letters saying, Hey, here's your opportunity. Protect your views, protect your privacy, know your neighbor. And oftentimes the neighbors will buy it. If they pass, I'll go to my buyer's list. If they mm -hmm. pass, I go to a little website. You probably never heard of it. Called Craigslist. It's the 10th most trafficked <laughs> website in the United States. I'll go to a even smaller one called Facebook Marketplace, mm -hmm. buy sell groups. And then I'll go to the lands, landmoto.com, landsofamerica.com, landandfarm.com, landhub.com, landflip.com, landcentury.com. There's all these little mm -hmm. platforms of people that buy and sell raw land. 
But the way that I'm going to sell it is where the magic happens. I'm going to make it irresistible. So I'm going to ask for a $2,500 down payment. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to finance the balance. Let's say, make it a car payment, $249 a month, 9% interest over the next 84 months. Mm -hmm. So I have my money out in the down. I might go six to 10 months out. And then I've got this recurring income of $249 a month, the next 84 months, 9% interest, no renters, no rehabs, no renovations, no rodents. And because I'm not dealing with a tenant, I'm exempt from Dodd-Frank, RESPA, and the SAFE Act, all this onerous real estate legislation. Mm -hmm. So then the game I, I play is how many of these land notes do I need before it, when it, that passive income exceeds my fixed expenses? Mm -hmm. And then it's total freedom, the Sharon Vornholt way, and I can live <laughs> my best life. Oh, I, you know, it is so interesting because um, the, the one thing, um, so, so you still will always have to be buying a certain amount of land, though. Once your notes are paid off, then you'll have to replenish your, your note stock over here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's, and that's the nice thing because what you find in this, in this niche is that people that bought it 10 years ago, they never did what they were planning to do on it. It becomes like a garage sale item mm -hmm. for them. Like if you look yeah. in your garage, you're like, boy, if somebody offered me 25 cents on a dollar for that item, I'd sell it immediately, get rid of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, oftentimes our plans change and, and that's, it just keeps recycling. Um, and then you, you, you know, about four to 8% of the time, depending on the market, we'll get defaults. So I might get my money out. Somebody might make two years worth of payments mm -hmm. and then you something happens. Resell it. And then I tell a land contract, there's no cost of foreclosure. I keep all the money and I just resell it. So now my ROI goes out even further. further. I get a new down, new mm -hmm. note pair. Yeah, that's a, that's a great model. So if I'm thinking about these particular times too, if someone is um, not in a good financial position now and they want to invest in land, do they know they still have to have, well, you said $2,500 down. Is there any play in that uh, for it, given that this we're in this particular situation now? Yeah. I mean, there's lots of ways to be flexible. I mean, you're buying any asset, 25 cents, 30 cents on yeah. a dollar. You have so much room to work with people. So on either side of it. So yeah, in, in this kind of economy, it's gonna be really easy to buy and you think it'd be harder to sell, mm -hmm. but, but it's not, not necessarily. Yeah. What we're finding is um, like this week, we had two people email us and say, hey, look, um, I lost my job or I got laid off. Can I reduce my note payment by 50% for the next three months? And we, we're automating all of it in a software called geekpay.io. We're like, mm -hmm. sure. So as long as they can make payment of something, something we're happy yeah. to, to, to rework the note. We're not a bank. Mm. Right. So that's, I, I know a lot of people are doing that. And some people, because they have, uh, my daughters are both property managers. So because they have, some of these properties have federally backed mortgages, they cannot be, uh, they cannot forgive them or, you know, they'll go out of business. They, um, they can have some flexibility, but it's a different situation than what you described because that, that money, that forbearance is going to come due. Uh, right. You know, so it's, a, you do have a lot of flexibility since you are the bank because your goal is still the same to get that recurring income and you don't really want them to, de to default. Although, like you said, you mm -hmm. can often make more money, but that's not really the business that you're in. Right. I mean, I, and I lived through this. Um, I really got hit hard. I want to say 40% of my note income just went away in 2010. Wow. And so I had never gone through a market cycle like that. Mm -hmm. I had to figure out what's the new pricing, where are the new downs, where are the new monthlies. It took a while mm -hmm. to rebalance that portfolio and get it working again, getting it productive. And today, now I, you know, this since I've done it, now I know exactly what to do and how to do it and how to treat people right. Because at that time I, I didn't realize what I could do and I would kind of play around here and there and to be, you know, to treat people really well. I would say, Hey, look, I get it. You lost your job. Um, everything that you've paid in, I'm going to give you a credit. And then when things get better as they inevitably will come back to me and we'll apply it towards another property mm -hmm. three, four, five years later, I'm reselling property. Those same people that bought in 
in 2006 and got hurt in 2008. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting you say too, it was 2010 for you because it was definitely 2008 here. That's when it all just like got really miserable. Yeah, we're on the long tail of real estate. So when commercial and residential are getting hit, mm -hmm. we don't really feel it for some time. Wow. And that's kind of the nice thing about it is that- Yeah, you have an advance um, notice. Yeah. We get advance notice, <laughs> but on the other side of it, we don't recover as quickly either. Mm -hmm. So while you're doing, while you were recovering, you know, prices were still remaining flat for us. Oh, and that's interesting. You know, when I think about you, I, I've never forgotten something you said to me one time. I don't know if you remember this, but you said your, your purpose in your business is to make yourself irrelevant to your business, except for being the face of your business. And I, I tell people all the time, this is what Mark, this is what Mark said. This is where you need to go. And you were very purposeful about getting out of the day to day of your business. But we've talked about this a lot too. Boy, it's not easy. It is not easy to do that. And I wanted no. to talk about, because I know that you are good at systems and processes and time management and all of those things. But I think, don't you first have to have a clear vision? Wouldn't that be step one, have a vision of what you want your business to look like? Yeah, absolutely. So you can use like the E-Myth model with Michael mm -hmm. Gerber. You can use the squares. We do something called swim lanes where we use lanes of, okay, here's this part of the business. So we break it out. Okay. And then the, the heuristic that like we use is what do you hate the most? Mm -hmm. So like the first part of our process is county research. So what's our system for county research? What's the methodology? What makes a good county? What makes a poor county? So that gets written out into a system. And then you train somebody. Like I remember when I was training my acquisition manager, once a week, he would have to do a three paragraph write up on counties. Mm -hmm. So I, would, I could see like, okay, is he getting it? Is he not getting it? And make adjustments. So then after county research, what's the next step? Let's get a list. Mm -hmm. Well, how do we get a list? So we got to write out all those steps. Do we go to the county assessor? Do we have to call the IT department? Do we have to go to a title company? Do we go online? like mm -hmm. agentpro247.com right. or datatree.com. Like, we're, how do we do that? Like, but we're going to get a list. Then once we get the list, how do we scrub that list? Mm -hmm. We want to get rid of all the other properties. We want to just have vacant land. Well, can we scrub by use code? Do we do it by APN number, assessor's parcel number? How do we do it for that county? Because each county could be different with their use code. But typically, let's just call planning and zoning or go online find out the use code. So we're breaking up the, every part of the business mm -hmm. step by step. Then, okay, how are we gonna send out our offers? Well, here's how we're gonna look at the comps. Here's how we divide by four. And we're gonna put it into our spreadsheet. And then we're gonna upload our spreadsheet into our software, which will then automate sending out the offers. Mm -hmm. And then so we have training videos on that. But Sharon, the, really the, here, the, the, the key of all this is, for me, it's mindset because I would get so frustrated with people in the beginning, like they weren't getting it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I, uh, I read some management books. They're like, look, it need, you need to take full responsibility for your team. If they're not doing a good job, it's probably you. Probably so you, yeah. The, yeah, the idea is a 30 to one ratio. So if it takes me five minutes to get a list, I have to multiply that by 30 of training time to teach somebody to, to they get how to get a list. So wow. if it takes, so that's sort of the mindset, like, but after that, I, I've spent that 150 minutes with somebody teaching, training, going through it, and they're still not getting it. Well, then it's clear to me, like, okay, I've got a system. I got a process. I have videos. I've been patient for this five minute task. And if they're still not doing it, then I know, okay, it's time to find another inexpensive virtual assistant. Mm -hmm. So do you use uh, offshore virtual assistants for most of your things? Yeah. Oh yeah. So we've got a team in the Philippines uh, that does a lot of our work. We have um, actually, we're working with some Jamaican VAs now. They speak oh. great English and uh, really uh, phenomenal work ethic, you know, college educated, very bright. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love the accent. So we'll get them on the phone. Yeah, man. You, you know, <laughs> yeah, man. You're gonna buy. You're gonna buy that lawn, man. You're gonna be a lawn mogul, man. <clears throat> That's interesting. So, um, yeah. You know, it, it seems to me when I'm looking for VAs, um, 
you seem to have had better luck with, with that particular level of VA. I have some that are good, but they're limited. Generally speaking, when I've gotten somebody that good, the, the college educated, the uh, whatever, like I needed someone to move my servers uh, from one place to another. That, that I was not trusting to somebody that wasn't really good. But I did find somebody on Upwork that was really good that I continue to use to this day for stuff that uh, I just, it's not my wheelhouse. Um, yeah, but, see, you know, I'm not messing around with Upwork uh, or, or Fiverr anymore. Like I'm going to referrals. I'm yeah. going to my, my community, like who do you know does mm -hmm. this really well? And do they have any hours available? Because that hours. way I'm getting a referral and then I'm, I'm doing that for three people. Mm -hmm. So I hire three and I keep one. I don't even interview. I'm like, here's a job. Can you do it or not? Like, well, yeah. what, am I, what do I care about? talking to them for that's that's a great idea see now i do talk to them but like um the the ones i've hired in the past couple of years have been um more costly like but they're more specialized like the server guy you know we're talking right eighteen dollars an hour but we're not talking a hundred dollars an hour like in the u.s so right. uh, but he was actually a referral from my um my VA that I use and I'm, I keep going back to her and saying, you know, who do you, who do you know, who do you know? But, um, yeah, that's, that's a great idea. And I like it. I've always been a proponent too of getting a couple people to do a job, but you get three. I get three. You I get keep three. one and I want to be bulletproof. Like really it, the human being is great, but at the end of the day, human beings, um, do not replace a system or a process. Okay. So, we want a really tight process and system and I want it so clear, so concise, so easily to under, so easy to understand that my 14 year old daughter can read it mm -hmm. and be like, Oh yeah, dad, I get it. But if she's asking questions I'm like, Oh, okay. I didn't think of that. So, um, it's, it's, it's really gotta be that detailed and that clear. Uh, you know, like the best system I think I've ever seen is one, uh, you, when you go on, like, it's too bad we can't travel anymore, but when we could travel, you go on an airplane and you would see that sheet mm -hmm. about safety. Mm -hmm. Like, kids could understand it. Yeah. Elderly could understand it. You didn't have to read. It was just the images. Mm -hmm. you could, you'd could understand how to do this in case of emergency. That's like the perfect system. Yeah, that's interesting. So then if I'm understanding you, if you go into a new area, a new county, then you would just take that new county and create a new system for that for that county then. Absolutely, here's how we get the list for this county. Here's our contact mm -hmm. information. Here's why we like the county for now. And then here's how many offers we're gonna make a day to that county. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna reevaluate it as the offers come back. Okay, so I like your analogy of the lane. See, in my mind, I'm going, that kind of reminds me of Trello because I'm a visual person. It's like... I uh, love Trello. I love Trello, but if I'm going to be completely honest, I'm, a, I'm the Libra poster child and I love the colors and the, the, the whole visual look of it, but it's great for, um, for keeping things on track. It's great for brain dumps. Just get it all out of your head, all the stuff you're not going to remember in two weeks or whatever. But that, so that makes perfect sense. Um, it gives people kind of a roadmap to, to begin to outsource. And maybe you've only got X number of dollars right now. Well, how would you most, I'm like you, what, what job do you really hate doing the most? Or what are money, or what are revenue generating activities that you can hire someone to do that will? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of yeah. what I look at. And, you get in these black holes sometimes, like uh, before the show started, we were talking about podcasting. So while it's not, you can't say, okay, it's, it's a revenue generating activity, but it's a necessary part of my business, which does, it's like your podcast. You do get recognition. You do get, there's an, um, a, a way that you generate income, but it's not like you're selling, selling a book or, you know, right. whatever. It's not this, not the same thing. So um, that, that's a really a good blueprint that you, that you gave someone. To, so you started with the thing you hate to do the most. Um, any other uh, tips for people if they're just confused about this whole thing? Yeah, I mean, you kind of alluded to, you're like, well, you know, it seems like we have a chicken egg problem. Like, mm -hmm. let's say I'm just starting out. Well, the cheapest person I can hire 
is myself. Right. And I don't think there's anything wrong with bootstrapping mm -hmm. in the beginning. But the biggest problem I see is, I hate to say it, is people try to penny pinch their way mm -hmm. to wealth. Mm -hmm. It does not work. Mm -hmm. If you look at every great company, none of them are penny pinching their ways to wealth. They're all thinking about scaling. Mm -hmm. At some point, you have to scale. You have to use leverage because you don't scale. Mm -hmm. If your efforts are, it's a one-to-one -one input, but if I'm using other people's time, other people's labor, I'm using other people's money, I'm using software, now I can scale. And a good example is Scott Todd. So Scott Todd was one of my clients. His first year, he did really, really well. He did 63 deals. Wow. He was doing great. I, and then I made a little tweak to him. I said, Scott, you've got a nice job now. Now do you want a business? Mm -hmm. I'm like, here's how we're going to create a business. We're going to get you out of it. Now he, he averages over 220 deals per year. He works an hour a week oh in gosh. his business. Oh my gosh. But that, but that, it's a mindset thing because he was doing everything and then step mm -hmm. by step, Just every get rid piece of, of the business got rid of it, used software, other people's money, leveraged himself, and now he just manages and looks at reports. Mm -hmm. So if someone wants to, um, if, if someone wanted to generate cash right now from land, like they, they need cash, they've lost their job, maybe they've dabbled a little bit, what is the, the, thing, they should, the, the thing they should do first to get a piece of land? Okay, so I actually created a free course um, teaching how to, okay. you know, sell, buy and sell property in 30 days or less okay. for cash. And, um, I'll give you the link. It is the landgeek.com forward slash quick deals. Quick deals. And it's a real quick deals and it's called the wholetailing model. Yeah. So essentially we're, we're eliminating one huge piece of the business, which mm -hmm. is county research, getting a list, scrubbing a list, pricing a list and then talking to sellers mm -hmm. and doing due diligence. Like all that gets eliminated in this model. So then you're just focused on buying wholesale from somebody that already went through all that hard work. And then you are going to be, so it's a wholetailing model. After okay. you buy it wholesale, you're going to then flip it retail and for either, you know, maybe make a hundred to 150% margin for cash mm -hmm. or 300 to 800% on terms, okay. depending on what you're, you're trying to do. So I'm going to have to check that out myself. Just, I'm, I'm, i like a lot. I'm a lifelong learner and that that's fascinating. So that would, I'll put that link in there for folks so that you can check it out because there are ways to generate cash um, fast. If you, if you know, yeah. know where to look for the information. Now, you mentioned that you're writing another book. So tell me about that. Yeah. So the first book was Dirt Rich. Mm -hmm. And then the companion book, so after people read Dirt Rich, is going to be how to scale your land business. And it's going to be literally all the things that we're talking about. Here's, you know, the heuristic of like, what do we outsource first? Mm -hmm. Here are the mindset shifts about not petty pinching your way to wealth. How you know when you need to start scaling and start building that scaffolding. So we're going to handle the the, the financial issue, the mindset issue. And then we're going to break down each part of the business. Mm -hmm. How do we hire? What do we look for as far as a virtual assistant, the places to find them, you know, hire three, keep one, what we pay them per hour, how we bonus them, every aspect of scaling the business, managing them, the technology pieces of it. We're going to, you know, just, Take somebody step by step through how to scale a land business. That's, that's, not, it's not going to be a bestseller, Sharon. It's really niche. Well, but, it's, but I like you know. but I like I like niche. So, so well, let me know when the book is out, and I I will definitely do a book review on that because I'm I'm betting you there are a t there's a ton of information in there that will apply to any type of real estate business. Same no, they're definitely same, yeah, same it, it principles. definitely will yeah. I will do a book review on your new book. Okay, thank you. <laughs> now I've got pressure to, now you like I've got the outline, so what, okay, now I've got to write it. I'm going to write it down. When's that book going to be out, Mark? Oh, Mark, sure. <laughs> really? 
Okay. Well, when I stop it. procrastinating. Uh, okay. Oh, that's pretty funny. So let's go back to books. We like to talk about books. What is the, the, the best book that you've read in the past 12 months or so? The one wow. you like the best doesn't even have to be real estate. Can be real estate. Doesn't have to be real estate. That is such a good question. So, you know, I, I love to read. I'm constantly reading. Mm -hmm. um, but the book that I love the most the last 12 months. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you what first comes to mind. Okay. And I don't know, I don't know if you have this problem, Sharon, but I, I have realized, especially during quarantine, I am a dopamine addict. <laughs> like I'm constantly seeking pleasure mm -hmm. to avoid any type of pain. So let's say for example, um, my wife and I get into like a little argument. My first instinct is to just grab my phone and check my email mm -hmm. because it's like, it's like, like, like the slot machine, mm -hmm. you know, getting that random reward. Like, did I get a good email? Mm -hmm. Did we get a flan sale? So I'm like self soothing through email That's or hilarious. <laughs> um, my business. So now it's like, okay, I'm flooding my brain with serotonin all the time doing this. Like, how do I really step out of it? And can I just sit with it? Can I sit with the uncomfortable feelings? Mm -hmm. And then can I be productive? Can I change that habit? And maybe when I feel a little anxious or, um, you know, I want to check my phone. Maybe I can do something that would be more productive, like write a chapter of the book. Maybe I could do something more productive, like read or listen to a podcast. Um, not constantly pleasure seeking and do things that are, you know, better for me. Maybe I'll eat an apple instead of grabbing a, you know, uh, a cookie. So I'm, I'm really learning this stuff about the stuff about me. And there are three books that really helped kind of, get me into that frame of mind. So the first one is Deep Work by Cal Newport. Okay. The second one is Essentialism by Greg McKeon. Mm -hmm. And the third one is Atomic Habits oh, by James okay. Clear. You read those three okay. books and you're still chasing pleasure. Um, then we need to start a support group together. <laughs> it's so funny that yeah. you had, that you talked about that because I had that conversation with a friend a couple of days ago. I used to kid a friend of mine. We'd be at, at an event or something, and I would tell him, you're like a 12-year-old girl. Put your phone down. We're having dinner, you know. And I, I realized I've become that person. And it, you're right. It's a self-soothing. I could be working on something or I could be doing this or that. But one thing that is going to make me change that is I have noticed that I'm not reading. I'm, I'm still buying books. I'm still ordering books. I still want to read, but I find myself sitting there. I'll sit down in the evening scrolling through emails and Facebook and mindless stuff, a waste of time. And it, it's so funny that you've just said, you said the same thing because I just had that conversation myself and it, you just want to say, stop it, stop it. It's not, it's not good for you. Yeah. It, it's like breaking an addiction. It's really hard. It is an addiction. It's really hard. And, and like I put on my calendar now, check email at 10, check email at four. So it's like, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to ignore email, mm -hmm. but I'm going to check it at these times. So I have it allotted. So I'm not constantly checking it whenever yeah. I feel a little anxious mm -hmm. and I want to distract myself. And I do the same thing then. So, okay, at 10 o'clock, I'll check my Facebook or, mm -hmm. um, you know, other things that are going on that, that, that will give me some type of dopamine hit. Mm -hmm. But that way, the rest of the day, I'm not constantly chasing these dopamine hits. Mm -hmm. And I can focus on that deeper work that may not initially be as pleasurable, mm -hmm. but are more impactful and meaningful and, and really give me self-esteem. Like, talking to you, right? <laughs> like, this is great. It, it, it is, um, you know, I, I, I kind of blamed it on our situation in the quarantine, but if I'm to be completely honest, it started before then. And, but I think the first 
the first thing is acknowledging this. I guess that, this is kind of like, I don't know what they do at AA. I've never been there, but acknowledging you've got a problem. Okay, so we've just done that. We've, we've got a problem we need to fix, but I didn't think really think about it in terms of a dopamine fix, but I, you're right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're all addicts in mm-hmm. some way. That's we're all sort of pleasure seeking. And, um, and it's okay. Like, look, I'm addicted to coffee. So what? That's I like it. I, I can afford it. Like, mm-hmm. it's a good addiction. Mm-hmm. It's great. I, I wouldn't want to, you know, just stop it because I'm an addict of coffee. <laughs> but if it was getting in the way of my life, mm-hmm. and I wasn't being productive, and every time that I had to go do something really deep or meaningful, I was going to, you know, grab a cup of coffee, mm-hmm. and therefore interrupting that either yeah. meaningful exchange or meaningful work, then that's a, that is a problem. That's a problem, but, yeah. Yeah, but I have a cup of coffee with my wife in the morning, no problem. Well, this has been so much fun, Mark. It's always, it's always fun. I just need to call you up when I'm down and go, let's, let's, just, do a, let's just do a show. Uh, I know you've got some programs, though, some great programs, and I want you to uh, talk about that just a little bit and uh, let people know how they can reach you and find out more about your programs that you offer so that you can become free like Mark. Yeah. So, you know, I think the best place to start is the mm-hmm. but you can go to that free uh, course, uh, the wholetailing course. It's a good way to get started. I've got a $97 passive income launch kit course that I'd love to offer your listeners for free, Sharon. Okay. Send me a link. So they, yeah, so they can just start at the forward slash launch kit. Okay. and get that course for free. But the whole idea is you want to get enough free information where you can really decide, yeah, this resonates with me. I like this model. It makes sense to me and my situation. And then we have tons of different training options okay. depending on what kind of person you are. Like, are you the kind of person that's really self-disciplined, gets up at five in the morning, goes to the gym, can work out on their own, get results? We have the do-it-yourself program. Mm-hmm. Are you the kind of person that without accountability, um, won't go to the gym and, and get results. We have a group training program. So you've got a, you know, Scott Todd teaches what we call flight school. So it's group training. But the thing about that, Sharon, is we force people to work the business. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you've got peer pressure in there. You've got accountability. Mm. Um, you will do a deal. And then we have this 180 day guarantee that says, you know, if you do the work, we promise you the, tuition costs of flight school are nothing like you're going to make your money back in 180 days or less or we'll refund you so we take away all the risk same thing with the toolkit too awesome. just show us your work yeah yeah I, I think that's a that's a great plan and some people most people need that accountability piece um that's it's been my experience anyway that people get all revved up about what they're doing and then life gets in the way and it kind of then they feel bad because they're behind and then the rest is history. But it sounds like you've got all the bases covered. No, I, I actually have to spend money like, like big money on a course now or a training for me to do it. Yeah. Because otherwise it's like, Oh, I'm, I, you know, like a, I'll find something <laughs> else to do. Like it's more pleasurable. So I need yeah. another human being to say, we're meeting at this time, Mark, mm-hmm. and we're going to do this, this, and this, and let me see your work. I'm like, okay, that works for me. Well, I think that's, I, I think it's great. This is, we almost had like a little counseling session here. <laughs> uh, well, folks, be sure to stop by my uh, Mark's site, uh, The Land Geek, and I'll put all the resources and the, cor- the courses and the freebies that he's got for you um, in the show notes. And for all the listeners, if you like this show, please share it. Um, and if you'd head over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review, I would really appreciate that too. So uh, thank you once again, Mark. Sharon Vornhold, it's always a pleasure. And yeah, hook, yeah, ping me anytime. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do quarantine we'll counseling. Do quarantine counseling. <laughs> yeah, we, we get our own little book club too. Like, we, okay, we what are you reading now? Literally. Um, to your credit, to this day, the two books I recommend the most when I go on other podcasts yeah. are the two books you told me transformed your business, the 12 week year combined with the one thing. That's and it. now with my clients, we actually, our coaching clients, we actually mm-hmm. send them those books. Yeah, that's an awesome idea. I, I really yeah. think those two concepts 
will will change your life if you implement them and follow them. And I still do that to this day. So, Mark, it was great. And folks, uh, don't uh, we'll see you next time. And that's it for today. Bye for now.